Hi my loves, so today I'm doing my January books video for you all. I know it is much later than planned, um, if you have watched my recent vlog you will know that I have been a little bit distracted recently by other things and when I need to talk about books I need to be in the right headspace so that's why it is a little bit late. Also I powder and powder and powder before I come on camera and I still manage to look really shiny. I seem to be unable to sort that out so you're just going to have to look at me shiny AF, it is just something about cameras and lighting it just makes me look crazy shiny i'm going to show you the pile because i did pretty well this month if you've been watching any of my book related content recently you will know i had about um 100 it's about around 150 i think it's just over 150 unread books on my shelves which was really deeply embarrassing just books i had accumulated and never got around to reading so i'm just gonna have to sit back um because otherwise my back begins to hurt and I was like, right, the challenge is in 2019 to read as many of these books as possible. And I figured if I read about three books a week, I can pretty much get through everything that I have on my shelves that I haven't read. More or less. I imagine there'll be like three or four books left over, which will be really irritating at the end of um, 2019. But anyway, so I've been trying to read a lot more is the basic thing I'm trying to say. So this is January selection. Ta da um, yeah, I feel like I've gone through so many worlds since I've read some of these. Okay, that's really heavy, so I'm going to put them down. Obviously we had Rebecca as our book club read, I'm going to get that out quickly. So we'll talk about that first. But first, next month's announcement for book club. Um, if you watch my recent vlog again, you will know that I picked my holiday books already before I filmed this video. So I kind of know what I'm going to be reading in February and half of March. Which I usually don't, I usually just pick things at random. And I was looking at the books like, mm, well, what am I going to pick from here that's going to be a good thing for us to read together. So I have picked The Idiot by Elif Batiman. Um, and... This is a coming of age novel, so I thought that might be quite nice for us all to read together. And it's about a girl who turns up at Harvard and finds herself dangerously overwhelmed by the challenges and possibilities of adulthood. How does she find friends? How will she fall in love? How does she deal with how difficult it is to be a failed writer and how baffling love is? It was a finalist for the Pulitzer last year, I believe. I hope because it's relatively new, it's not going to be really hard for you guys to get your hands on or super expensive. I imagine there'll be like Kindle versions and stuff like online versions that you can read. Um, but yeah, so this is what I have picked for us for February. All information about the book club will be down below as always, but there's literally no obligation from you guys. Um, just read along if you want to, basically. Let's get started. We have a lot of books to get through. Um, I'm also gonna try and be a little bit more organized this month. Um, because I feel like I edit these videos back and I just go like, what on earth are you saying? Like, you are making no sense whatsoever, Jessie. Please sort yourself out. So we're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to try and be a bit more structured. I still don't know what I'm going to say about some of these, including Rebecca. It's the one I haven't written a review for, so I really don't know what I'm saying about this. This book, if you don't know, is about a young woman. The young, naive, unnamed narrator of the book falls for a kind of older, middle-aged, um, richer man whilst away in Monte Carlo. And they kind of get married on the spur of the moment. And she goes back to his estate. Um, if you guys don't know, I think this was written in the 1920s, I want to say. Okay, no, actually the late 1930s. It's a younger book than I thought it was. But yeah, so she goes back to his Cornish mansion. And there she finds herself kind of coming into conflict with her husband's, her new husband's like past wife who has died but the kind but kind of her presence fills the house and begins to almost haunt her so it's a gothic novel and it's been a long while since i read a gothic novel but i just remembered how much i enjoy them there's so much fun a lot of the kind of tropes that make things like scary or atmospheric um, that we know of today come from gothic fiction so um, Daphne du Maurier does an excellent job of really creating that like uneasy creeping atmosphere um, both in her descriptions of Manderley which is the mansion and its grounds um, which is just so beautifully wrought I want to visit there I think anyone who reads this book really wants to visit Manderley it's like your classic English countryside thing it's almost like cinematic especially like the opening chapter 
um, I can see why it's so famous. It, yeah, it really brings it to life in your mind. Like what a skill to be able to do that with your readers. And I also think du Maurier has a talent for um, really working with very relatable insecurities to create that kind of haunting atmosphere. The narrator feels awkward and embarrassed and inadequate compared to the memory of Rebecca. In case I didn't explain that, Rebecca is the past wife. I think everyone who reads it can really relate to that um, feeling and therefore it becomes more effective. In general, I really enjoyed this book. I enjoyed the reading of it. It's very gripping and I really wanted to know what was going to happen next. Um, so big fan of all of those elements. I loved the way um, Du Maurier made Rebecca pervade the space. I'm sure you could do, I'm sure people have written a lot um, about this book and the space and the place and how like Rebecca just invades it and kind of pervades it. Things I didn't love so much about this book. I thought the twist could have been better. I don't know if um, as kind of modern readers we are a little bit immune to lots of like twists and turns that could have happened and I was maybe expecting something a little bit bigger. I've just realised I've had lipstick on my teeth for possibly the entirety of the first bit of this video so I'm very sorry about that you guys. You're just gonna have to deal with it because I have no idea what I just said. So I would thoroughly recommend this one. I, d I If you follow me on Goodreads, you're probably really irritated with me because I give basically every book a three. And that's because I wish they would let you give half stars. I don't know when Goodreads is going to listen to us. But um, yeah, I kind of, sometimes things are closer to a two, the two end of three and sometimes it's closer to the four end of three. I imagine I probably gave this one a three, but in reality I'd re rate it about a 3.5 to 3.7 or something like that because um, I really enjoyed it I just didn't think it was like wow like seeing loads of really fun crazy things it's just like a really good read um, I'm sure you could get a lot out of it if you analyzed it you guys probably know what I mean okay so I think I'm kind of gonna go in the order in which I read things from now on we have to start with everything under by Daisy Johnson which I was actually reading in the latter part of December into January in fact, no, I think I finished it in December, but I filmed my December books video early. That really doesn't matter. But. So it's been a little while since I read this one. Um, I really dislike this book. Before I go on to describe what happens in it, I think you guys need to know that. Um, I'm going to give you guys the spoiler. It's something that I didn't know whilst reading it, but I feel like it would have improved my reading experience personally. But this is a retelling of Oedipus. Um, I had no idea about that until I had kind of got to the end of the book and then I was like oh that kind of makes sense and would explain a lot of Daisy Johnson's choices in this book. So it's um, told mostly from the point of view of a character who I think in her like mid to late 30s um, is reconciled with her long estranged mother who has dementia and it's about that character's kind of search for answers about some of the things that happened in her childhood um, when they lived on like a houseboat and they kind of went up rivers and canals I imagine in the south of England. It's got a very dreamlike style, um, it's got lots of folkloric elements um, uh, like the main character is called Gretel for example I think is trying to be read almost like a fairy tale um, it's very dreamy, um, it's full of water metaphors, quite lyrical. Some of the writing's really nice and some not so much. The themes in this book seem to be gesturing towards like gender, motherhood, um, you know there's characters which defy gender very much in this book. Um, obviously it's a retelling of Oedipus but with a um, Edible character that defies gender. Yes, it's kind of inching towards Angela Carter-esque, but I would say for me personally it is nowhere near as good. So what did I like about this book? I just couldn't find much to like about it. Um, one thing I will say is that the writing felt very debut novel. I think the book she's released before this was a collection of stories, maybe, so I think it might be her debut novel. Um, and it just felt just didn't feel very confident, the writing style didn't feel very confident, it felt a little bit just like 
experimenting with creative writing kind of thing. I don't ever really know how to describe that feeling I get from some books when you just know the author's not that confident in what they're saying. Um, maybe it comes from kind of not being sure what your story is. But anyway, so I imagine that I think that she has lots of potential and she could definitely improve in the future, but this was not my cup of tea. Um, so what didn't I like about this book? So I'm going to try and not go on forever because I didn't like a lot of this stuff. Um, I personally find classical referencing really tricky because I don't like when authors use it kind of for no reason. Um, just to kind of make the book seem better intellectually somehow. So the Oedipus thing, once I found out about it, I was like, mm, this kind of explains why I don't like this book very much. Um, because I just feel like, like I said, she's gesturing towards those like motherhood, gender themes, but she is relying too much on that underlying Oedipus thing to make it seem like it has meaning. She doesn't really say a whole lot, plus the book is not very, I did, personally didn't find it very enjoyable to read, like it's just so wishy-washy and you guys know I read a lot of plotless lyrical books, um, I have no problem reading that kind of thing. I don't need a really big storyline to keep me interested, but in this one it just wasn't enjoyable, it was just too all over the place or repeating stuff that we'd already heard a million times. Um, one of my big notes was that this book could have done with a lot of editing. I think if a really good editor had got hold of this and just like teased out from Johnson what she actually wanted to say, what the dialogue between Oedipus and gender, what she actually wants to say about that, and cut a lot of the stuff and refined some of the writing because some of the writing was edging on the ridiculous. Um, so anyway, obviously <laughs> this was not my favourite book. I will give it a 2 out of 5 because there is lots of potential here I think. There was some nice writing but yeah, I don't know, you guys, I didn't, I did not love it. I think that feeling I'm getting is that it's just trying too hard. Next up we have Frankenstein in Baghdad by Ahmed Sadawi or Sadawi, I'm not really sure. Um, this was winner of the International Prize for Arabic Fiction and it was shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize in 2018. Um, the title does what it says on the tin. This is about the tragic situation in Iraq um, post US occupation or during US occupation um, about the violence and uncertainty and sectarianism of living in Baghdad at the time. But it's told in a satirical, very matter of fact way Oh, if you guys don't know, this is obviously a translated novel. And it's also told using Mary Shelley's Frankenstein um, to kind of put that all in motion. So yeah, like I said, this book is a satire. Um, it's very like, it feels very on the nose, but it's saying um, lots of stuff in the undercurrent. It's very darkly humorous and it's very much about the kind of grey area between good and evil and how you can tell who's good in a kind of city at war like Baghdad. Um, so what did I like about this book? I liked a lot about this book. So basically he creates like a cast of characters surrounding the monster figure. Um, we've got the creator of the monster, the kind of Frankenstein figure, who pieces the monster together with the body parts that he finds on the street. We have like an old lady who thinks the monster is her missing son who's been missing for many years. We have a journalist, a state agent who's taking advantage of the chaos. Um, and we have, who else is there? Like a hotel owner who obviously no longer has any clients. So um, it's a big cast of characters and he really writes them amazingly. Like they're very well drawn. Um, the old woman was absolutely my favorite. She was by far the funniest. And I think he does a great job at that. So I wrote in my notes, it's about the futility, chaos, madness, and surreal, surreality, surreality of war. Is surreality a word? Yeah, this kind of mythical creature um, almost becomes something you could imagine 
happening because of the chaos of the situation. It flows really well, it doesn't feel too um, like it's trying too hard, I think the translation is excellent. So yeah, lots to like about this book, big fan of it. Things I didn't like about this book, the only thing I think if you were to read like the um, blurb and then go and read the book is that you might expect a little bit more monster and a little bit less from the kind of surrounding characters and you might but you still get a significant portion like you still get the kind of Shelley-esque like monster speaking bit um so you still get some um, it also describes itself almost as like a detective kind of novel on the on the blurb but it isn't really you know it's kind of clear um, early on that the monster is the monster. That's my only criticism of this book but in general I would definitely recommend this one. I can't remember what I gave it on Goodreads but again it was one it'd be one of those like 3.5 to 3.7 kind of vibes. Um, yeah really really like this one. So next up we have three books that I'm kind of going to talk about together and together they make up um, N.K. Jemisin's Inheritance Trilogy. So you guys know I love N.K. Jemisin. I wrote my dissertation on her Broken Earth trilogy. That's her most recent series um, and this was her first series. Now she writes pretty quickly so it's actually they actually weren't released too long ago but she has developed lots as a writer. What are these books about? I feel like I was really immersed in them for quite some time because as you can see this is like hundreds and hundreds of pages but now I have forgotten everything. So they're set in a world where um, gods take you know material-ish form and you can see them and interact with them and they kind of look like humans um, and there's lots of gods and the books start with a young girl going to like you know the main palace of the kingdom where most of the gods especially the important gods have been um, imprisoned and put on leashes and made pets for like the ruling the ruling family or clan or whatever um, and that clan worships one god who has put all of his brothers and sisters and lovers and whatever um, in imprisonment. I don't think I'm explaining this very well. <laughs> it's basically one god has overthrown all the other gods um, and has favoured a particular clan in the kind of human realm. Obviously this all needs rectifying so that's kind of what happens over the course of the three books. The three books have like different stories, they each follow like a different character I think probably about 10 to 15 years apart each one so they're not all super similar actually and they don't really follow like one big through line um so these books are also fantasy unlike broken earth which is closer to like a sci-fi fantasy mashup but they are written in jemison's very readable chilled style what did i like about these books i what i loved about these books most of all i think was being able to pick out all the things that jemison then took and developed in broken earth because as you can tell i'm kind of obsessed with that series so um i could really see where what she'd taken um and she'd taken like the best of her writing and really developed that but unfortunately there was a fair bit that i didn't like about these books now that eminently readable books there's nothing wrong with them um but they just weren't up to jemison's current standard which is fair enough to her first books um i found the first one to be a little bit messy had some logical problems um and i found them all to be very derivative of other fantasy with the most recent stuff jemison writes she basically writes She's basically like reinventing the genre in lots of ways, whereas these very much felt like they were just like fantasy novels. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, it's just like I love her newest stuff so much that I was a little bit disappointed. Uh, the second, the th I thought the first book was the worst because it was so derivative because it's like young girl goes to palace. Um, I thought the second and third were much better. She just writes about like non-royalty, like you know normal people much better which is kind of what the second two or the, at least the middle book concentrates on um and yeah and i said that the second book felt more focused and then the third book did make me cry to be fair jemison has this magical ability to make me really cry loads um so the third one did make me cry it got me involved it just wasn't as good as her newest stuff. But would I recommend these? I don't really know. They're still like a really, they're still not so derivative. Like they have their own Jemison touch, which I love. 
and they're quite an it's quite an interesting concept there's a lot to take from it inspirationally i think but maybe not like in the reading of it it isn't like super they're never gonna, they're never going to be your favorite books i think if you're a big jemison fan and you love broken earth um it's worth going back and reading these just for those little bits of broken earth that you can pick up on and see kind of how she developed as a writer i'm glad i read them but i don't know if i would be like you must read these if you guys know what I mean. Um, so next up we have the book that I have forgotten, which is Upstairs, which is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, which is not gonna take me too long to talk about because it is a very little novella. So the book is about two friends who are kind of itinerant workers. And one of them is somehow intellectually impaired, kinda, or like even socially impaired. Uh, and ends up getting himself kind of accidentally into violent situations without necessarily meaning to be violent and he his friend tries to keep him out of these things um, sort of so they go to work at this place and there's this woman who kind of seems a bit flighty basically they end up getting into trouble so I've actually never read any Steinbeck before but this is kind of classic American writing style wise um, I loved his writing style I like that kind of simple direct to the point but also somehow quite beautiful writing um, I like that style so I was enjoying that um, I thought it built tension really well what didn't I like about like about the book I think you can already see from my description of what happens in it kind of some of the things that age the book um, so the depiction of someone who possibly has a disability is not it's kind of like dehumanizing in lots of ways and the figure of the woman is a bit problematic as well um, but at the same time but at the same time it is hard to judge books to like a modern standard like that but it's just something to be aware of when you're reading it it's also super short um, so you don't really ever like get into it um, unless you study it I imagine it's never going to be your favorite book either just because it is kind of like gone like that would I recommend it I think yes I need to read more Steinbeck I'm definitely interested having read this book to read more Steinbeck I haven't been like no that's not for me yeah I would recommend it especially if you like classic American fiction um and it's such a quick read as well it's to be easy to read so next up we have The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner so this book I started off disliking and then about halfway through um, I started liking it. However, I was drinking champagne at the time um, and was not completely sober when I started liking it. So I just, I don't really know if that epiphany about the book was linked to drinking alcohol. I don't really know. So this book is about, um, but it kind of describes itself as a women's prison book. And it is narrated by someone who is in a women's prison. And she kind of talks about in like little snippets about her life and about other people's lives that she meets so a lot of it takes place outside the prison as well um so the thing i didn't like about it initially is that it just um rachel kushner had obviously done a lot of research when it came to writing this book if you're already very familiar with the injustices of the prison system it kind of just felt like quite obvious almost it was just like bitty like i said it kind of flits around from person to person, from episode to episode. Um, I said that everything is there for you to read, but does that make it too obvious? So like, yeah, it's kind of like a just sh spilling facts to you, basically. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if you don't know much about injustice in the prison system, then absolutely things like this are really important. Other non-fictional things as well. Um, but it's just, yeah, made for a weird book. However, about halfway through, the narrator's child becomes quite an important part of it. And from that point, I suddenly just really got it. Like it just clicked a little bit more. And yeah, it just all made, the, just the whole book just made a bit more sense. I don't really know how to describe it because you shouldn't have to sympathize with characters in order to understand the injustice that's happening. Um, that's just I just think empathy and sympathy in that form is sometimes quite useless um, and you need to know the facts so I don't think you need to worry about someone's child in order to understand but I just feel like if you are going to just talk about the kind of facts of the matter then a novel isn't generally like the best form 
to do that in and also you could kind of let the women speak for themselves because I imagine that Krishna did a lot of interviews and stuff for this uh, anyway but it ended I ended up liking it I don't know if that really makes any sense to you guys because I don't want to have to sympathize with characters to feel for a cause I think perhaps because I already felt for the cause um, and it was a novel I was just looking for better writing worth reading if you know nothing about it and then going away and listening to like the most recent series of Serial or something like that as well. So next we have an unusual book, um, another really fast read this one. This is The White Book by Han Kang. Um, I think it's semi-autobiographical this, but it's basically, it's neither a collection of stories or nor a collection of poems and it's not a novel. Um, it's like, I'll just show you guys some of the like, so a lot of the pages are blank obviously because it's kind of a book about white and the blankness is just as important as the writing. But yeah, it's basically a meditation on the colour white, lots of it is, but it's also about how the narrator, her mother's first child, um, only lived for two hours, um, was born during a snowstorm and sadly didn't survive. So in this book, the narrator slash Han Kang is trying to reconcile herself to her own grief that she feels um, towards the kind of sister that she never met or the sister that had she stayed alive would have meant that she wouldn't have lived um, and she's trying to reconcile all these feelings and kind of her mother's grief the innocence of babies and all that kind of stuff trying to reconcile all of that through the colour white it's very beautifully written and very beautifully translated so whoever is translating Han Kang's work is doing an incredible job in fact I'll give you their name Deborah Smith I knew that I thought it was poignant I thought it was beautiful I thought it described grief very beautifully I wrote so these are my notes it's about grief the fragility of life the inheritance of pain through the mother girl line um, time doubleness innocence writing what it means to give life through the body um, how to write because also I think it's also kind of a book about writer's block um, it kind of feels like an exercise in getting over writer's block anyway materialism all of those kinds of things so definitely recommend reading this one because it will take you an afternoon maximum um, and it's very beautiful and it's a really lovely example of writing of its kind at the same time it's not like super dense um like it's not super dense poetry or anything it's very like it's there for you to see it it's not not understandable so i definitely recommend this one next up a very different book but our second satirical book this is moo by jane smiley you guys know i loved a thousand acres by jane smiley it made it to my top 2018 books or books that I read in 2018 because it's a 90s book but yeah Moo is another one of her novels obviously it's about a university campus in the Midwest in America again it's got a big cast of characters um, lots of the reviews that didn't like this book said that they didn't they couldn't keep track of which girl was which and whatever so I kind of made a point whilst I was reading it to keep track of each of the girls and all that kind of stuff it's something that you have to do with like a big cast like this it's all free and direct style um, but you'll get the kind of perspectives of lots of the students and the professors it's a very it's just a satire on university culture basically so what I liked about this book I think Smiley is just a great writer lots of this book was really humorous I think um, that it's kind of been misunderstood by a lot of readers and reviewers in the past having kind of read up a little bit on its reception um, it's very much designed to be like a funny book um, and there are definitely humorous moments in it some people find it a bit dense and long it is a little bit dense I wouldn't say it's too much it's just it just requires a little bit of concentration my note says a bit thick with words sometimes not always a page turner a bit more slow paced um, whatever you want to take from a bit thick with words um, just go for that so yeah a few convoluted sentences but generally very assured and accomplished do, do, do. but yeah it's a satire about um, like university life you know academics really loving themselves and thinking they're changing the world and the world changing the university through privatizing it and about like student life and about capitalism and its kind of invasion of, of university life and how that kind of undermines so many of the ideals of the academics and all that kind of stuff 
Um, and in that way, it's kind of very understandable for any of you guys who have studied that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I, I really, I enjoyed this. Um, I wouldn't say I liked it as much as A Thousand Acres. I don't know if everyone would enjoy it, but if it sounds like the kind of thing you would enjoy, then I would recommend it. Okay. Oh, I'm missing another book. <laughs> My pile should have been even bigger, you guys. Um, I'm missing Signor Vivo and the Coca Lord by Louis de Bernier. Okay, so this is the second in the Latin American trilogy. I read the first one probably about four or five years ago. Um, luckily, they don't really... They cross a little bit, but it, this is like a self-contained story in itself. So, if you don't know, um, Louis de Bernier is heavily influenced in the Latin American trilogy by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. They have definitely have elements of magical realism, um, and they're quite like a similar, like, um, funny style. Um, again, almost like satirical sometimes. Um, sometimes like darkly humorous, and they're often violent as well. Um, anyway, this particular book is about like a Pablo Escobar figure um, in Bernier's fictional Latin American country and um, his kind of rivalry with a local, I think he is a journalist, I can't quite remember now whether he does something else and just writes to the paper, I can't really remember but anyway, and his kind of rivalry with yeah, someone who keeps outing his terrible antics in the paper. It's more focused on the latter character, the Pablo Escobar-esque figure is not like a big big figure in the novel. I like Bernier's style and I remember really enjoying the first one. I imagine, I don't know quite what I would think of it now having read this one and going back to that one how I would feel about it but very much like Love in the Time of Cholera by Marquez which I read like a year or so ago. I don't know, I don't know if you guys remember me reviewing that. Um, but the sexism in these books is just like crazy. The female characters are baffling. I won't say any more, but like they're, they're quite sexist. Um, I don't know whether you could say that you could write it off as part of the like narration style, but I don't think you could really. This one seemed to have, seemed to be less enjoyable to me than the first one. I don't know whether it's because I'm a more experienced reader now, or I think this one, I just feel like this one had less of a story and less focus than the first one, which was very much like a good yarn. This one is a slimmer novel. It just wasn't quite as there wasn't as much going on. Like, I've written here, like, some parts were completely irrelevant and just, like, seemed shoehorned in. It also doesn't always have the effortlessness of Marquez. Sometimes it feels a little bit like it's trying too hard. Um, I also don't know, like, de Bernier is not from Latin America, so I don't know how Latin American readers would really feel about these books, so I don't know whether he has the license to play quite so much as someone like Marquez. It was kind of... I kind of still like his style, but I just kind of hate those elements. Um, make of that what you will. Next up we have From a Low and Quiet Sea by Donald Ryan, another long lister from the man booker. Um, this is probably the book I remember the least about, it's like least memorable to me, which is a little bit sad. It follows, like there's three sections and each one describes a man. The first being a Syrian refugee, um, the second is a young man who has just had his heart broken, he's in Ireland, just had his heart broken and he works as a carer and he lives with his mum and his granddad um, and it kind of follows like typical young man problems. And then the last one is a kind of semi-repulsive older man character who kind of has a lot of life regrets and wasn't that nice of a guy and he kind of speaks about his like only real true love. Um, I don't know if he speaks about it or if it's all in third person or what but the first section was definitely the best which I thought was quite interesting because obviously Donald Ryan I presume doesn't have experience being a refugee um, certainly not a Syrian refugee so I found that part definitely the most moving part of the book and there were moving moments throughout it's quite straightforwardly written I wouldn't say there was a lot in terms of like themes um, and that's where I kind of get confused about this book I don't think I'm spoiling this by telling you guys but three characters are like weirdly brought together and it just does not work. I'm kind of still baffled by it a little bit. Like, 
it just it's really like random and like forced and weird um i don't know if there's a point to it and i just wondered like why like what's going on here um and each of the vignettes was not really long enough for me to really care apart from that first section like i said nonetheless i didn't dislike it as much as i disliked something like everything under um but I just didn't really get it. Right, next we have My New American Life by Francine Prose. Uh, this is another one of those books I absolutely hate it. <laughs> I feel like there's gonna be a lot of this whilst I'm trying to make my way through all these books I've bought because um, there's a reason they're unread, some of them. So this book is about an Albanian, a young Albanian woman who goes to work in like the suburbs of New York. It might be, or it might be New Jersey or something. Uh, I think it is New Jersey and she tasked with looking after an american boy while his father works all day the mother's kind of run off um so she looks after this this teenage boy her life her quiet chilled life in new jersey in this house gets invaded by some other albanians who suddenly want her to do illegal things for them and it's supposed to be like in a kind of comic style it's supposed to be, you know, about Im being an immigrant and about the culture clash. I felt like the depiction of Albanians or Albania didn't seem particularly assured. Like, I don't know if Francine Prose knows lots about it, but I just didn't feel like she was really showing Albania as Albanians would. Yes, last spring I travelled to Albania to do research for the novel, so she is not Albanian and it really showed. <coughs> Neither am I, but I, even I could tell. I wrote that this book is like someone that doesn't really know what they're writing about. I didn't really get the storyline of this book. It's like a super disappointing storyline. Nothing much actually happens. Um, there's a lot of repetition, like the characters say the same things to each other over and over again in like this suburban house. And it's just like, what? what is the point here? There's no tension where there should be tension lots of it is very clumsy my final note on it was what's happening in this book i truly don't know so there was not a lot for me to like about this one unfortunately would not recommend plenty of other excellent immigrant novels out there you guys okay finally is this finally yes it is finally for january 2019 less by andrew sean greer um this won the pulitzer prize for fiction in 2018 and it's a lovely little book i wouldn't say it was anything amazing um like prize winning <laughs> but it's a it's a nice little book this one it's about a man having a middle-aged crisis basically he's a failed novelist about to turn 50 um his ex-boyfriend of nine years is about to be married um and yeah he's just constantly living in the shadow of someone else and doesn't have much self-confidence at all and he decides to go on a kind of like round the world trip to <clears throat> to avoid going to this wedding I read a lot of comic novels this month because this is also um kind of supposed to be a comic novel and there's lots of parts of it that are very humorous it's very readable and not very dense at all what did i like about this book i like lots of things about this book i thought that the um themes of love and getting older and queer love um particularly were really poignant and beautifully written it was very endearing i liked some of the yeah i just liked some of the writing i thought it was quite beautifully written in some parts and like at the end it almost brought me to tears um yeah in that sort of way i thought it was yeah just a nice read like when he describes love as having an ally in life the description of how you know relationships not a failure because it ends um, is this night a failure because it will end in an hour? Is the sun a failure because it's going to end in a billion years? <laughs> like quotes like that. What didn't I like about this? I didn't think it was anything crazy. Like it's not saying anything wholly new. And I don't know how many people will sympathise with the failed novelist kind of trope. Um, like the depressed male novelist. But yeah, 
I liked it. I thought it was sweet. Um, if that kind of thing sounds like your kind of thing, um, then I would definitely recommend this one. But it just depends on what kind of book you like. And that, my loves, is everything. Did we really just go through all of those? Amazing. So, I've been filming for an hour and seven minutes. <laughs> um, my throat is tired. I'm going to go get a cup of tea now. But that is everything from me, you guys. I really hope that you enjoyed um, this month's book video and congratulations if you made it to the end i don't know how long this video will actually will actually be i have had a really good time reading more it means i'm scrolling through instagram a lot less and i love that i have managed to make my way through all of these worlds in one month long may it continue i hope we're gonna have a big pile for february as well i know that that video is gonna if i'm on time hopefully come to you like in two or three weeks so um Yes, you've not got that long to read The Idiot. I will keep you keep you updated on Instagram whether it's going to be like definitely on time or not. Also, I will leave a link to my blog post down below summing up these books as well if you guys want like a record, if you want to come back um, and want some information on what I thought about a book. There's going to be some like semi more detailed um, reviews on there of some of the books I thought I liked the most and the books I liked the least. So yes, but thank you guys so much for watching today and I will see you again very soon. Bye!